Another top story we're following, it's almost 24 years to the day that a truck loaded with explosives tried to bring down the World Trade Center in New York. Six people died in that blast and many more were injured. Today we learn that the Muslim cleric who helped orchestrate that 1993 attack is dead. Ryan Yenis has all the details on the man known as the Blind Sheikh. Hello everyone, that was an obituary from Fox News on the death of Omar Abdul Rahman, the Blind Sheikh the man behind various terrorist plots in New York City in the early 1990s. In the preceding couple of minutes, Brian Yenis went on to give an overview of the Sheikh's involvement in the plots and the bombing of the World Trade Center. However, in spite of what was promised, he did not have all the details. He did not mention, for example, the CIA's role in bringing the Sheikh to the United States and protecting him from law enforcement once there. And this is what we're going to look at in the next few episodes of this interview series of Adam Fitzgerald how Islamist terror came to the United States and how it came at the invitation of the CIA. We will of course be looking at the major incident of the early 1990s, the bombing of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. However, in this episode, we'll start off by examining two murders that took place in New York City, which really gave a strong indication of what was to come. Now here's Adam giving a somewhat more extensive biography of the blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. Omar Abdel Rahman, uh, commonly known as the Blind Sheikh, uh, was born in Egypt uh, in 1938, uh, was the leader of Al Jama al Islamiyah, uh, which is an, an Islamic militant group based in Egypt. The um, group was responsible for the Luxor massacre in 1997, um, which killed 58 Purst. Um, Rahman is blind, uh, hence the name Blind Sheikh. He uh, lost his sight at age 10 and remarkably memorized the Quran while reading in Braille. Um, as he grew older, um, he became influenced by the works of uh, Sayyid Qutb and Ibn Tamir. Um, as he became older in years, Rahman was known to hold lectures in Egyptian universities and towns and became a popular antagonist against Kamal Nasser's presidency, claiming that um, he was a secularist. Um, and he was a polytheist um, who would not be trusted by because of his link to the West. And by the 1970s, um, Rahman found himself imprisoned because of his ties with Gamma Islamiyah and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which was run by Amin al Zawahiri. Um, so by the 1980s, he became the leader of Gamma Islamiyah and became more outspoken against the Egyptian government. And um, after Anwar Sadat's assassination, Years later, himself and hundreds of other Islamists were arrested, and they were uh, charged with conspiracy to commit uh, murders in Washington. Um, during a rare televised encounter, Ayman al Swahiri um, is shouting from his prison cell about the harsh treatment of the, the religious Muslims under the Egyptian national police and the secret police themselves. And now, Omar Del Rahman will be seen in the short clip standing up and joining in the Islamists shouting after al Swahiri spoke. Um, it was here where he was tortured for three years and realized uh, due to the fact that he was blind, he was not affiliated with Sadat's murder, he was released. Um, so he, uh, he was actually released and then um, I would say that uh, he had a lot of dealings with the intelligence services. Um, I would say that the CIA had some dealings with Rahman as far back as 1986 is going back to the Iranian Revolution. And the CIA wanted to have Rahman as an insider to the Egyptian Isla Islamists, someone who had a close uh, contact with the Iranians as well, as recent classified documents have come out of the years. Um, but the CIA even had dealings with Buhala Khomeini as far back as 1963. And I mean, even just explain who Khomeini is and why that's relevant. So. Um, why is that relevant? To, uh, well, it, only because um, when, because the CIA had withdrawn Mohammed Mossadegh and they wanted someone who they could control because when um, uh, the, the overthrow happened, the, the country started to change. And this this they, is Iran you know, now, right? We're just, just sorry, right, this, keep it, this is we're in Iran now. So right, we're in Iran. overthrow Prime Minister Mossadegh and then... That, that's correct. And they wanted to control the change that was happening in the region itself because they knew that the puppet government that was under um, in, in Iran, the CIA had allowed Rahman itself to 
to obtain a U.S. visa in 1986 because of his close links with Khomeini and the Iranians and as well as the Islamists in Egypt. So they found him as a valuable asset for information okay. regarding so as I understand that the CIA were concerned there could be a sim like a Sunni version of the Shia revolution in Iran happening in Egypt and uh, Jose Mubarak could be overthrown and then they would need contacts with the Islamists in Egypt if that happened and Rahman was a, a potential candidate for that, right? So that, that was a reason to keep this guy around because the amazing thing being he got into the United States in spite of being on a watch list a terrorist watch list and was able to move in and out of the United States and apply for permanent residence all quite freely. Am I right in my understanding of that? No, that's precisely correct. I mean, even while Rockman was under a uh, U.S. terrorist watch list, he happened to obtain a U.S. visa twice uh, through the U.S. consulate in Egypt. And, and that was in the 86 and in 1990. In July 1990, Rockman had entered the uh, United States. And it's reported here that the reason the CIA uh, wanted to have Rahman as a close associate was because uh, in, was to help the Mujahideen factions fighting each other to unite instead of giving, uh, using the guns uh, that was provided to the Mujahideen, uh, money the CIA was, was giving to the Mujahideen against the Soviets, um, Rahman wanted the weapons and the funding to be mailed back to the United States to the Islamists themselves because after the war, remember now, the Islamists had you know, returned back to their native countries and a lot of them came to the United States. So in 1990, when Rachman entered the United States, um, there was a large following of Islamists that went back to cities like Tucson, New York, New Jersey. Um, even yeah, that, that's an important point to make because I, I didn't get really, until I looked into it, the scale of support that was coming out of the United States. I don't mean just mean the United States government here, but from Muslims in the United States, both financially and in terms of recruits going over to Afghanistan. Right. Now, the, the problem here is, is that they considered the jihad. Remember that the, this new uh, offensive jihad that was taking place in the second half of the war, uh, which is the eternal struggle physically, not metaphysically, which is what um, the earlier Arab uh, uh, Imams were preaching when Abdul Azam preached this new offensive jihad was the struggle against the imperial powers against the um, Muslims who were the, the victims of imperialism. So they brought this jihad now to outside of Afghanistan into you know, the United States, Southeast Asia, and what have you in these countries. So now that this jihad was to continue. It's almost like it, and, and a war that extended the boundaries. But um, this was the problem the United States was, was going to have. And I, I, I find it um, quite troubling that they couldn't see the problem of funding these jihadists in Afghanistan, that the backlash was uh, going to come to hurt them. And this is the case when the blind sheikh returns to the United States, because when he returns to the United States, even though um, he admits that, yes, you know, they, they gave us uh, the necessary funding and weapons to fight against the Soviets. We still consider them the great Satan. And in many radio broadcasts and mosques uh, uh, that Bachman held uh, in the United States, he considers the West the, the enemy to Islam. And only because of their um, geopolitical influences through Israel and Saudi Arabia, which helps to... Um, uh, uh, have a demonizing position to countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Egypt, and uh, even in the Philippines and Thailand, where the most radical Islamists are being, on the other hand, ironically, being funded by Saudi Arabia, none other than Saudi Arabia themselves. So when you have um, this, this imperialistic uh, expansion of the borders regarding Israel, the military expansionism and the geopolitical influence that the United States has, and of course the, um, the preconceived enemies that Saudi Arabia supposedly has in the region, especially the Shiites, the Alawites, and um, the, uh, the metaphysical uh, Islamists themselves, they consider them polytheists. Yes, um, you are going to have a, a sheer backlash from these Islamists who consider uh, the United States as the greatest perpetrator of these problems. Okay, and the, the visa issued for Rahman, was it like a one-off, right? Now, maybe you just want to mention 
um, Michael Springman, uh, the officer at the embassy in Saudi Arabia, the US embassy in Saudi Arabia, and what he kind of blew the whistle on in just the sheer number of visas that were being issued to Islamists throughout the, the late 80s then. Right. Well, well, J. Michael Springman actually is more famous for, of course, um, that he uh, actually suspended the applications of 10 to 12 uh, Arab nationals in the consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which is where he was stationed at. Um, he, he, his um, authorities actually overrided his decision and they expedited the process of gaining uh, these uh, temp visas to these um, Arab nationals who had questionable backgrounds. Some of them couldn't even speak English properly and some of them couldn't even explain why they were entering the United States to begin with. And so J. Michael Spring was absolutely right in suspending his application. But he was overridden um, by his superiors in, like I said, the consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, also, while giving out these visas in the early 80s, he was coming into contact with numerous uh, CIA agents themselves, overriding his decisions to expedite the process of known Islamists that were coming out of Egypt and Lebanon, and, and in Syria, no less, as well, in Algeria. So when you have these questionable backgrounds of these people, who shouldn't have been in the United States. I mean, Abdel Rahman, like I said before, was on a terrorist watch list not once, not twice, but five times. Um, he was a known uh, instigator, antagonist, um, and known to be affiliated with some of the most notorious Islamists in Egypt, uh, most notably Ayman al-Zwahiri, um, and also to the Muslim and links to the Muslim Brotherhood as well. Um, but he was allowed to um, be given to U.S. visas, and not just temp visas, these are lifetime green visas in the United States. And he was allowed to be traveled freely. And then, and of course, um, he was a, a report given out by an anonymous FBI agent where they were saying that the CIA even knew this, knew they was in a watch list, and they said, and he said that the CIA couldn't even complain about uh, ignorance on the matter because they knew he was a terrorist, knew he was a terrorist sympathizer and supporter, and knew that. Um, that uh, he is virtual in hatred in the United States and Israel was quite known even far back as 1982 when he was being tortured in the prisons in Egypt. Okay, so he's he's in the United States then. He's um, in this mosque in Brooklyn and the Al Kifa Refugee Center in the same building. What's going on there? What are they up to? Like, it has been this funding and recruitment center for the Afghan Mujahideen. Um, with the winding down of the Afghan conflict, what, what's going on at the Al-Kifa Center when Rahman's there? Okay, well, the Al-Kifa Center was built inside the al Farouk Mosque. And now, the al Farouk Mosque, which is located in Brooklyn, New York, and still is currently, to say, still around, uh, was founded by uh, Fawaz Dharma, um, who was also the imam there in 1986. Um, in 1987, Mustafa Shalabi, um, Fawaz Dharma and Ali Shinawi would incorporate the Al-Kifa Refugee Center, which is extensionally a branch of the uh, Maktab al khidmat in Pakistan. Loc it's located inside the mosque itself, and we, this would be the direct contact with its operating base, the Maktab al khidmat led by bin Laden, al zawahiri Nazam. Now, uh, Abdul Azam and Mustafa Shabi, um, close friend, and who are inextricably linked to the um, Afghan Soviet war, Chalabi and Mahmoud Abelina uh, would run the day to day operations in the Al Kifa Center. Um, the Brooklyn Mosque and Center would be the main operating branch for bin Laden and Al Zawahiri. Now, um, Ali Muhammad was a close associate and student to Abdel Rahman, who, in, in a later interview between myself and Richard, I'll, I'll also give a more in-depth profile behind Yeah, he's, he's such a central figure. We just have to touch on him in the next few episodes and then really sure. devote the whole episode to him. Because... Right. Now, I'll just give a brief. Now, sure. he, he'll, he'll have close ties to many of the mosque's notable members, including um, El Sayyid Nusser, Mahmoud Ambalima, and Fawaz Dama. And like I said, I'll, I'll give a later discussion of why Mahali Bahabi is uh, really important to uh, future events of what's going to happen from the al Kifa Refugee Center. Okay, so what we're really, we're building up to here is um, 
there's two assassinations take place, right? Which are, uh, I think the first side, the first act of this Islamist terror inside the United States, right? So the first one being the assassination of the, the Jewish extremist and founder of the Jewish Defense League, Maya Kahani. I mean, please say as much as you want to about that character, and then we'll move on to about his, his, his murder. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, Maya Kahani was a um, Jewish ultra-nationalist who founded the Jewish Defense League, JDL. Uh, the JDL was an organization which protected Jews from um, anti-Semitism and was committed to having Jews emigrate back to Israel called the Aliyah, um, have uh, Israel as just a, a state for just for Jews. Um, on the evening of his assassination, Kahani was at the Marriott Hotel in Manhattan. Um, shortly after his lecture, he was at a table talking to others when a man dressed as an Orthodox Jew approached him and shot him at close range in the neck. Um, the assailant ran down uh, and entered the cab, which was supposedly run by Al Mahmoud Abalima, um, because he's a cab driver. But when he got into the cab, he found out the driver was not Mahmoud Abalima, and then the taxi driver noticed he had a gun. So the assailant left the cab and ran down Lexington Avenue, and he was confronted by a postal service guard. They had both been exchanged gunfire, and running behind them was the JDL members who were chasing after El Sayed Nusayr. Now, El Sayed Nusayr was seriously wounded, um, and he was apprehended by the NYPD. It turns out the uh, suspect was El, excuse me, El Sayed Nusayr, a member of the Al Farouk Mosque and a loyalist to Omni Al Um It would later be noted through a confidential informant's report that a few, just a few short days prior, to Gahani's assassination that El Sayyid Nusser had a meeting with my sheikh in his apartment. And when the detectives from the NYPD searched Nusser's apartment in New Jersey, they managed to find a remarkable cache of items, which included um, photos of New York City landmarks, such as the Statue of Liberty, the World Trade Center, newspaper clippings of like notable public figure, uh, figures, Notepads, which notes had like a nitric acid fertilizer, thousands of rounds of ammunition, documents describing details of a Islamic militant cell, mentions of the term Al-Qaeda, um, surprisingly, and as well as a number of taped sermons by Abdel Rahman, and probably the most damning and most particularly interesting, um, top secret uh, documents from Fort Bragg classified documents belonging to like the Joint Chiefs of Staff from the Army Central Command, documents that would later be linked to Ali Muhammad, who would be found to have terrorist links while also being in the Green Bay's in Fort Bragg. Now, um, Joseph Pirelli, the New York uh, Police Department's chief detective assigned to this investigation, managed to um, publicly declare the assassination of like the works of a um, quote unquote, lone gunman. Um, now he also quotes the following before reporters, and I'll read from quote, I'm strongly convinced that he acted alone. He didn't seem to be part of any conspiracy or any terrorist organization, end quote. Um, this questionable resolve was even later reported by the 9-11 Commission, um, stating that the reason for this error in judgment was suspecting only no ser was that the New York Attorney General wanted a quick and easy resolution mm -hmm. to the matter. And they, they feared it was a wide raging investigation when unearthed an intricate uh, terrorist organization for which they were legitimately ill-equipped to handle at that point. They didn't have like a joint terrorism task force at that point. And there was only two agents um, from the uh, New York uh, terrorism task force that had a general knowledge about uh, Islamic fundamentals, but they were um, they were really ill-equipped to handle. But it was also duly noted that um, Robert Morgenthau, who was the Manhattan District Attorney, had implied that the CIA had informed the FBI not to pursue other leads involving the assassination of Khani. Now, this theory is quite feasible only because it was the CIA who were also covertly funding the al Kifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn during the height of the Soviet Afghan War. Okay, yes, so these two 
explanations offered for what is a very incredulous story in many ways. Also, um, it's worth pointing out that I think the FBI have been monitoring the El Sayed Nasser and Ali Muhammad at shooting ranges prior to the assassination, but didn't continue the monitoring because even though they suspected they might be up to no good, they weren't committing any crimes and did not at that point, at least is the reason they give, did not at that point have the resources to do that kind of wiretapping because there wasn't this perception of an, an Islamic threat within the country. So how, how credible do you find these explanations, Adam, knowing what you know? Because it, I mean, one thing I think people could suggest is the idea of um, the New York Police Department not wanting a wide-ranging investigation to definitely get a conviction of Al Sayyid Nasser. It sounds like a limited hangout, right? Like you come up with something of an excuse to stop a deeper story being told about the CIA preventing an investigation because they're protecting Omar Abdul Rahman. Right. Now, I, I think, of course, when the investigation into Saeed Nasser went a little bit deeper, I think what Robert Mogadol's claim is true. I think that because the CIA had contacts with the Al Keeper Refugee Center, and because they considered them to be a viable asset for the Soviets in the Afghan war, when that ended, um, the CIA still had close contacts. Now, also, too, remember, the FBI also had an informant inside um, the Al Qaeda, uh, the Al Farouk Fox themselves, and Imad Salem. And in another uh, interview, I'll also go into deeper research, uh, well, and deeper and talks in depth about who Imad Salem was. Mm -hmm. Imad Salem um, was, was an informant for the FBI in that they wanted an ear inside the mosque itself and to find out what Bakhman was up to. But remember now, you have competing agencies that were inside the Kifa Mosque, the CIA, the FBI. Now, noting that um, they weren't liable to share information with one another, so you have two uh, uh, agencies that were competing for uh, pertinent information inside the mosque themselves, so the investigation couldn't properly be investigated and go further, um, which is the reason why Moussaire was um, incredibly let go of the murder for Connie, even though, I mean, Gary got shot and he had, you know, they had the gun on him. Yeah, well, just, so just explain that for the listener, Adam, that there right. wasn't actually convicted for the murder. Right. Yeah, he was actually let go of the murder, but he was convicted, ironically, of the gun charge. And, and given, given the, the maximum, maximum possible sentence, maximum possible possible sentence. because the George right. thought it was ridiculous that he'd been, that he hadn't been right. convicted. Right, because now the backlash to that was the orthodox, the religious orthodox, which gathered outside the courtroom. They, you know, they, must, they couldn't believe that um, that he was uh, uh, let go of the murder itself. And William Kunstler, who was actually the defense lawyer for um, Al Said Osir, um, stated that um, uh, it wasn't his fault. Um, but he couldn't get him off the gun charge. He was given the maximum possible sentence and he's serving uh, life in prison for it. But um, well, he was later convicted of being involved in all the conspiracies. Right. I, mean, I, mean, well, like, I, I didn't want. Well, I didn't want to get into that right away sure. because sure. we'll talk about that further uh, in another interview, which, we, of course, he um, which will lead into after the '93 bombing, because um, he's convicted for uh, giving the okay uh, to bomb like the Washington Bridge and other other um, high value targets inside. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain that. Sure. In, in sure. Another so, the the other the other point of this is that the trove of documents found at El Sayed Nasser's house, which remained untranslated, but they, there were clear references in it to blowing up tall buildings and such things. Um, and again, the the reason given was that there was no sense of their importance or no resources to have these documents translated and fully looked through um, and no real interest taken in the fact some of them would come from Fort Bragg which laymen like myself would think that would be highly interesting right and something that you'd really want to go through so again how, how credible do you find those claims that it was a case of uh, an absence of resources um, well, take it with a pinch of salt, because the FBI actually states that the reason why they didn't have those documents translated from the Arabic language is because they didn't have an Arabic translator. Um, now, 
I, I, I do agree that they were properly ill-equipped, like I said before, to handle the situation. However, be that as a case, they could have handled, they could have uh, contacted an outside agency that uh, had close links to uh, terrorism task force. Um, they could have went to Langley, Virginia, for that matter, and had the document translated. But I do think that what they didn't want was, um, they didn't want to find that there was an extensive or a, bur a burgeoning problem that was just starting of a terrorist, a Islamic terrorist organization that was happening inside the United States because of the simple fact that they couldn't do anything about it. And that also this leads to conspiracy theories of Riles, that the FBI was actually letting the problem ferment to the problem that, we're, that we, you know, we have experienced today, current day. Um, but like I say, with a grain of salt, believe the, uh, the, the, the official version that they couldn't get the documents translated because they didn't have the translator itself. But um, also, I think the documents coming out of Fort Bragg, this was a huge red flag because they, um, of course, the FBI knew about Ali Muhammad because he was an informant for the FBI in San Francisco, in New York. He was also a triple agent with the CIA abroad in Egypt, here in the United States. He also had uh, close links with Omar Abdel Rahman. So, in, like I said in other, in other interviews, I'll extend a little bit further on Ali Muhammad, but it has to, it has to raise red flags right there. Um, with the documents, the classified documents that this guy could pull out and found in the home of a known terrorist, if that didn't warrant any more um, investigation, I don't know what will, because um, if that didn't show that there was a much bigger problem happening with the FBI happening inside the United States, and which could lead to a bigger problem systematically within the military and internally and externally, um, it just leads one to believe that the FBI ignored the issue altogether, or that they feared that um, that the problem was too big that they can handle. Okay. Do you want to maybe just briefly touch upon the assassination of Mustafa Shalabi? Sure, sure. I could, I could talk about that yeah. if you want. Um, well, let me... Well, maybe uh, start by saying who he is. and just Yeah, know. right. Uh, yeah. Mustafa Shalabi, um, who was a co-founder of the al for Refugee Center, um, was a close associate of Abdul Azam and um, Omar Abdel Rahman. When Rahman entered the United States in 1990, it was Shalabi um, who would welcome Rahman to the center um, and he would hold lectures at the Al Baruch Mosque inside. When the um, Soviet Afghan war ended, funding for the Mujahideen went to the center instead. Um, now, this would lead to a disagreement between both parties, uh, between Rahman and Shalabi. Um, Shalabi wanted to appropriate the funds between, uh, uh, be, uh, he wanted to appropriate the funds back to Afghanistan to rebuild the country. He wanted to rebuild the homes and the structures in Afghanistan. While, meanwhile, Rahman wanted to use the funds for the jihad, which he wanted inside the United States and abroad. Now, this led to a, an immediate falling out between the two men. Um, and Rahman would give sermons denouncing Shalabi. So the word spread rather quickly, and Shalabi's own trusted members turned against him. And Bachman banished Shalabi from his own center. Um, Shalabi was warned by, by even his closest associates and family that there was direct threats to his life in the weeks preceding his, his, his uh, denouncement by Bachman. Now, Shalabi would take immediate notice, and he wanted to go back to Afghanistan to help build the country on um, Azam's orders. Now, he, he would later like sleep with a gun nearby his door, near his bed. He, you know, he feared uh, Rahman. And on February 25th, 1991, it was noted that um, Shalabi heard a knock on the door. And when he answered the door, uh, the men had rushed in and beat him. And he tortured him. He stabbed him in his torso. And then he was shot in the head. Um, when the detectives arrived uh, later, they found that Shalabi was tortured, stabbed repeatedly. Um, he also found red strands of hair. and this is noticeable because there was only one red-headed um, member of the al Keep of Red, and it was Mahmoud Abalima. He called him, his nickname was called Red. Uh, incidentally, although no one was ever charged for the murder, the suspicions were quite loud and clear. And it was all pointed to um, uh, the blind sheikh of Rahman. 
Okay, so these two assassinations, the first sign of a growing problem within the United right. States with extremist Islam and the jihad in the West. And it's fundamentally true to say they emerge from a CIA asset in Abdul Rahman and another one in Ali Muhammad. So you've got this close intertwined connection between the two where the line is very blurred and you can't really see what's what right from the get-go. Right. And that will continue in the next episode when we talk about the World Trade Center 1993 bombing. Sure. Right. Anything else oh, you want to go, go ahead? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, all I wanted to say was um, now we're starting to see the intelligence apparatus closely aligned with the Mujahideen fighters that are coming out of Afghanistan now slowly integrating back into their respective countries, most importantly, the United States. And what we'll see in the future, in later in, um, in uh, interviews, is that we're going to see the problem become much more expansive and much more problematic for um, the United States itself. But the, the close alignment between the CIA and these um, Islamists will be more noticeable in future events, which will lead into, even beyond 1993, into 1998, into 2001, and much beyond that to the current day. Um, but it's, there's no um, hidden agenda here. CIA itself knew about this problem even far back as the 1979 beginning, which is the reason why I like to begin from the Afghan Soviet War from that point to the current day itself and the expansionism of Islamic militancy and how closely aligned they are with the CIA's own investments within the United States and the regions abroad. Okay, thank you very much for that. And as I said before, next time we're looking at the, this major event of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Right. See you then. See you then. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.